we are connected. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. The Catalyst webinar series is a weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. We are very honored and excited and proud to have Mark Pansiera on the webcast this morning. Mark is the CEO of the Pacific Institute. Mark is an accomplished business owner, community leader, executive and entrepreneur. He is, the, as the CEO and partner of the Pacific Institute, Mark focuses his efforts on driving the growth and performance of organizations, teams, and individuals, working with Fortune 1000 companies, government agencies, healthcare systems, educational institutes, athletic teams, and nonprofit organizations. A well-recognized TED, TED, TED Talk uh, presenter, speaker, and author, Mark is frequently asked to share his insights and experience. He has appeared on ABC's Wall Street Journal report, CNBC, and CBC, the Canadian Broadcast Company. Good morning, Mark. Thanks for joining us on the Catalyst webinar series today. Thank you ha for having me, John. Really pleased to be with you all. No, oh, we're delighted that you're here. You're going to be uh, delving into a little bit about what the Pacific Institute is all about and mindset matters. It's Absolutely. All this is on Zoom, so uh, the audience has been asked to uh, enable their screens, and uh, you feel free to stay off mute. Everybody, if you want to interject or have questions or comments along the way, Mark has encouraged you to do so. Mm -hmm. so thanks, Ms. Pansiera. She's all yours. Thank you, John. And good morning, team. Mindset Matters for the PGA Professional. Well, we're going to begin with a test this morning, and it's not going to be an easy test. It's going to be a bit challenging. Uh, it's very important for you to get the right answer. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of sets of instruction. I'd like you to concentrate and please participate via the chat. Um, again, I'm going to direct you and ask you a few questions, then, then put the answers in the chat and we'll interact that way. What I'm going to do next is put a sentence on the screen. And I'm going to ask you to really think about the sentence, the meaning of the sentence, attempt to ascertain what the sentence means. And then put that meaning in the chat and uh, I'll give you my thoughts regarding your thoughts re uh, about the meaning of the sentence. Following, I'll give you another set of instruction, but we're gonna start there. Here we go. The meaning of this sentence. How about you first, John? Do you have a meaning of that sentence? Go ahead and take yourself off mute. What does it mean to you? Um, the look of bewilderment, it's okay. The uh, organization, um, organization it's, is key. Okay, good, very good, thank you. Nikki, how about you? There's a start and there's an end to everything. Okay, good insight. Can the group come off of mute and share your thoughts? I don't see anything yet in the chat. Is that possible, Nikki, for the group to interact? Yes, they can, uh, they can type into the chat or they can take themselves off mute. Okay. Well, it seems like it's deer in the headlights out there. So I'm gonna give you the next set of instruction. Instruction, John, thank you. And Nikki, thank you for your, for your thoughts. So the next, the next instruction is um, for you to read the same sentence that I'm gonna put back on the screen. And this time, instead of focusing on the meaning of the sentence, focus hard on uh, counting the number of letter Fs. F is in Frank. Okay, you're going to read the sentence one time through, and just in the sentence, do your best to get the right number of letter Fs. I'm going to keep the, the sentence on the screen for about seven to 10 seconds, so it's going to be pretty swift. Put the number in the chat box, please, and then we're going to come back for the last set of instruction. Here we go. 
number of letter Fs. I see John concentrating. I see Nikki concentrating. Three, two, one. John, how many Fs? Three. Okay, Nikki, how many Fs? Five. Five. In the chat box, I see some folks weighing in. Five, five, eight from Jonathan. I see, I see a six. I see a three from Brian. Um, thank you for your activity. I see a six for from Amberlynn. Were we all reading the same sentence? <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you for chuckling, getting a little uh, crowd participation here. Well, we were all reading the same sentence and actually there are seven Fs in that none, sentence. None of us were correct. I've done, I've done this exercise so very often and I still only see three Fs in finished files and scientific. Why? Because what we just experienced is called a scotoma moment. The word scotoma in Greek means blindness or blind spot, something hidden in plain sight. John is asking me to hold. No, 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 I'm gonna write that down. That's a quiz question, scotoma. Qu quiz question, absolutely. Tweetable quote. If you take nothing else away from our time together this morning, this is worth the price of admission. Just to understand the dynamics of something that is hidden in plain sight, something that you are cognitively blocking out. And why did that happen? Because I am putting you under the very pressure that you all live on, live under, excuse me, as PGA professionals, as teaching pros, as GMs of your clubs, as club managers. And uh, I actually sent you down a path to throw you off of the proverbial scent when I said, when I asked you, what is the meaning of that sentence? So John, you were right to look bewildered because it really didn't have a solid meaning, but both you and Nikki gave it your best shot. And then I said, make sure you get the right answer. It's very, very important for, for you all to concentrate because this is a hard test. Now think about it metaphorically. Isn't that what we're all under every day? The pressure of attempting to get the right answer, the pressure to help those that you're coaching get in the right flow of their swing or making sure that you are impacting those as leaders to have them join your team and be really servant leaders. Not only love the game of golf, but love servant leadership, client experience and, uh, and uh, stepping up to um, uh, to, to extraordinary heights, as John expressed to me yesterday, that you all are really missing now as it relates to this po post-COVID-19 malaise, trying to secure the right talent for your organizations. So, Skatoma moment. What I want to help you do um, is for the next 30 odd minutes together is help you become Skatoma busters, if you will, for one another. So I'd really like to go offline now. And I understand it might be a little bit of a challenge because we're just dealing with the, with the chat box, but share with me when any of you might've had a Skatoma moment, a moment when personally you said, oh my gosh, I, I lost my keys. And they might've been right in front of you or in your pocket, but you're telling yourself that you lost your keys and you were blocking them out even though they're in your possession. So John, Nikki, any thoughts about your Skatoma moments, please? Sure, absolutely, I mean, sunglasses on my head. There you go. Happens all the time. Here at the, uh, here at the club that I work at, you walk by something every day and uh, a member, you know, after walking by it every day for six months, a member says, hey, are you, uh, are you ever gonna get that, that spot of ketchup off the corner of that, whatever it is? And it's like exactly. you walk by it every day and you have blinders on, you miss it. You know, exactly. another thing that comes to mind is my children looking for their shoes. You know, they can't find their shoes, they can't find their shoes. And you walk into their room and the shoes are in the middle of the room in, in plain sight. You know. Perfect. Right on. Nikki, please. Well, John took my, my sunglasses or, or any glasses uh, for that matter. I don't know if this, this counts or not, but, you know, 
walking into a room to get something and then forgetting what the heck you were going in there for. Maybe that's a sign of older age. I don't know. No, but Nikki, you are right on. <laughs> Happens to me all the time. How about when you're on your cell and you're talking to a friend, say, wait a second, I just left the restaurant and I left my cell at the cash <laughs> register. I'll call you right back. And they look at you, but you're both laughing and, and, and you're on your mobile. Uh, we see the activity from the audience, pen in the ear, looking for pen, daily occurrence, looking for pen. Absolutely. This happens to all of us. But you just learned why it happens. You get thrown off and you're missing something in plain sight. Now, I want to always come back to application with all of you as PGA professionals. How does this happen in your daily walk when it comes to attempting to secure the right talent, that right servant leadership part. So you're employing folks that not only love the game of golf, but love the service to those that enjoy the game of golf, no matter if it is in you know, the quality of turf or working in the, in the cart barn or being the starter or being part of wait staff or making sure the finances are in order because you're the GM, where might you be missing something because of the pressure that we've all dealt with as it relates to the dis-ease of the disease, if you will, coming out of COVID-19? Some thoughts, please. Throw them in this chat. Anything from you, either Nikki or John? Well, I mean, I think glaringly with uh, coming out of COVID, a lot of us in the, uh, in the golf business during that time uh, the service changed because there was so much play, but nothing else. I mean, golf has been booming, but access to the, to the tee sheet, basically golf, 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 but no organization, not, not any tournaments, no private events, not a lot of gatherings. So from that sense, it's made us kind of lazy. And now that we're coming out of that and we're starting to do events again, and we're starting to have groups, we're, we're out of practice and it's easy to get overwhelmed with, uh, with returning to regular life because we've been away from regular life for so long. That, that is a great point. And we do a lot of work at retail and, and I presented to a group of facility managers the other day and out of the Wall Street Journal, there, were, there, were, um, there was a graph showing statistics of retail rebounding. I mean, it was a typical hockey stick approach, but they had that, they're, they're suffering from that same malaise you know, we, we, we want to get back to normal, but uh, now that we're moving back to normal, are we, are we ready for the customer? And will that customer return a second time? They're going to give you, they're going to give you this opportunity because they're going to come back someone in droves. We're feeling this pent up demand, but very much in your customer service business, in, in your, in your, I mean, it's an entertainment business, if you will. Will they come back the second time? Will they give you a second chance? Because they're not going to wait for you to get out of that COVID, COVID malaise. So thank you, John, for weighing in on that. Anything from you, Nikki, that I'm going to move on. Um, I would just say looking at our day to day, um, from, from the section perspective of, you know, having to work remotely for, for extended length of time. And now as we sort of transition back to, we call it, like to call it a hybrid model of, you know, sometimes in the office and sometimes remote and, you know, really trying to stay on, on, um, on top of communicating with each other and, and continuing to build and, and foster relationships it can be a challenge. Absolutely. And we got, we have to help one another be, be scotoma busters and, and allow the um, folks to be a bit vulnerable saying, hey, listen, I only saw three Fs. Can you help me? I'm saying this metaphorically, but can you help me see the seven that you say? So you all have the same picture. Absolutely wonderful. Moving on. So here is an ultimate scotoma moment. You all see that? The caveman pushing the wheelbarrow with round wheels up the hill with square wheels. You see it? Yes, thumbs up, John, Nikki, cool. So I'm gonna share with you the very Skatoma moment that I had. Um, interesting, interesting journey that I've taken to become the CEO of the Pacific Institute. I, I actually am an undertaker. And for those of you who enjoy TED Talks, take a peek at it. It's only about 10 minutes, but it'll, it'll truly provide some insight and motivation as it relates to your journey as professionals, PJ professionals, because I know you are all very, very competitive. I love the game of golf. And what keeps me coming back? That one, that one swing and flow, that one perfect shot. And I may post a 92 that day, 
Um, I, I'm embarrassing myself by, by telling you all that, but it was that one perfect shot that brings me back or that perfect meal or that perfect, that perfect scenery or that perfect connection with a friend at the club. Well, interestingly enough, um, I went through the very F exercise, finished files exercise that I just shared with you during a, a seminar for a grief recovery group in my funeral home. And uh, they're on their grief journey, attempting to work through, you know, the tumult of, of, of the grief after the death of a loved one. And uh, an organizational psychologist from the Pacific Institute put us all through this F exercise. And I thought I was a smarty pants and I knew it all and I was going to get the right answer. But I was letting all these geriatric folks go ahead and go to the front of the class and participate. And son of a gun, if I could have sworn there were only three Fs there. And I, I knew that I was going to get the right answer. No, no issue. I'm always right. I'm in my lane. I'm a subject matter expert. But oh my gosh, did I realize that I should have had a V8 McFly? I don't know if I'm dating myself, but what else am I missing? Right? If I if I only see these three F's, then where are the other four that I am missing in life? And so in turn, I took a step to learning more about the Pacific Institute. And so what I'm going to share with you over the next several minutes is not just going to be blather and hype, you know, stuff I watched on YouTube uh, or, or read in the book. It actually is cognitive science, science that teaches us how our brain works, how we actually have the user's guide to our mind at our disposal when we and we can intentionally um, uh, ignite it in order to drive greater performance. And we've been doing that at the Pacific Institute for 50 years now. I mean, we work with extraordinary athletes, elite war military warriors, uh, Fortune 50 executives, and incredible leaders like all of you. And so I went from burying the dead to breathing life into the living around the globe because I realized I was missing something. That was just about 13 years ago, but I'm still living that journey every day as I pinch myself, uncovering more, discovering more that at times I don't see all seven Fs. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to challenge you, what else are you missing currently, both personally and professionally? Are you willing to be a scotoma buster for yourself to break through, tap into your potential, drive great, greater performance than ever before? That was an intentional pause. So you could start processing through that. Now, what's very interesting as well, as I began to dive into mental technology, understanding how the mind works, performance science, cognitive science, social sciences, I came upon my most favorite book of my lifetime. Um, I'm not gonna tell you the title of the book, but I'm gonna recite this quote and ask you if you've ever heard this before, what the mind of man can conceive, can come up with and believe, actually believe that it exists, it can achieve. Have any of you heard that? John, Nikki, have you heard that quote before? Okay. Are you aware? How about in the chat? Any of you heard that quote before? A good yes or, or thumbs up or something. Anybody in the chat? Think and grow rich. Jim A, thank you. Jim Smith, can you come off? of mute, is it possible? So you can tell us that story or at least uh, the experience that you had in reading that book, Jim? Think and Grow Rich? No, John, John, Ed, have not seen before. Okay, well, if we can't get Jim off mute, I'm gonna share you this, share this story with you. This book, title of it is called Think and Grow Rich. And uh, it actually is a quote uh, by this gentleman, Napoleon Hill. But it's more than a quote. Um, this was the result of a 20 year study commissioned by a gentleman named Andrew Carnegie. He was a steel magnet, well, I believe the richest man in America at that time out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he commissioned this gentleman, Napoleon Hill, to travel the country and meet with the most successful individuals and find out what made them successful interview them to understand their mindset that drove them to success or even their tactical expertise. What made them so famous, so wealthy, so special? So he goes around the country and he interviews presidents of the United States, 
and he interviews Henry Ford, uh, the likes of uh, Thomas Edison and others like them. And after a 20 year research project and interviewing north of 500 leaders, the best in class in the US, he comes up with this one statement, what the mind of man can conceive, come up with, visualize, okay? affirm in their mind and actually believe, be efficacious about it, believe it, it can achieve, okay? How many of you playing golf have visualized the shot, have visualized the shape of the shot? How many of you have practiced in your mind that perfect swing and flow or the perfect swing of those that you're teaching or that perfect banquet, visualized it, affirmed it and moved towards it? How many of you have witnessed water in your mind? In your mind's eye, water, can't go in the water, can't go in the water, put down my worst ball, can't go in the water, and got water, okay? So I'm sharing with you real-life circumstances that manifest this very statement that, that was written about 100 years ago. Fast forward, fast forward, we at the Pacific Institute work with these academic advisors that that provide us the science behind mindset mattering. Actually understanding that you can put your brain under a functional MRI and based on the, your own thinking patterns can create, can, it can, can create a morphology, a new shaping of your brain through synaptic firings just based on your thoughts for good or for bad. And so fast forward from a concept after researching 500 liters, Fast forward 100 years to science, we can prove that mindset matters. So it happened in my life, eureka, aha moment. It's happened over a century of time, um, um, uh, investigating the mindset of successful folks. You all in the world of golf understand the dynamics of affirmation visualization. But do you understand that you can have that affirmation visualization actually manifest, actually live the shot that you just shaped in your mind. And so I wanna give you today the elements, the tactical elements that you can employ to manifest the very things that you want in life, but also in your professional career. And it's not all happy talk, it's not woo woo. Yes, it's the soft skills, but Leaders of today know that the soft skills are the hard ones to master. I'm going to stop there, take a breath. John, Nikki, just weigh in. Any thoughts? Is this resonating, please? It is. It is indeed. It is. Just trying to absorb it all, Mark. A lot of stuff? Yeah. Yeah, but all good. Do you both believe, and this is I'm leading the witness, that mindset matters? Because that yeah, was, it, it seems to me that for the positive is as equally as it is for the negative. When you talked about, you know, don't hit it in the water, don't hit it in the water. What do you do? You hit it in the water. Um, we all teach our students, you know, to think positively and to visualize, you know, positive outcomes. Um, how impactful uh, or how heavy is that negative uh, predisposition versus a positive disposition, because it's obviously a lot easier to be negative than it is to be positive. That's a great question. And for the audience, I did not ask John to ask me that question, but uh, it's a pretty daunting answer. We've got 50 to 70,000 thoughts that go through our mind every day and 80 to 90% of them are negative. So, you know, the whole notion about what grows naturally in the garden, the weeds do. So we've got to be good gardeners, if you will and making sure that we snap ourselves out of that downward spiral, understanding un, uh, 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 th through, through um, awareness, the scotoma moments that we are missing something to snap ourselves out of those, those moments, if you will, and refocus on what you want, um, uh, what you're desirous of, what the objective is. I'm gonna go deeper with in, into that in just a second. How is this concept different than the power of positive thinking? Well. It's not just PPA, positive, power positive. There's a PPA, there, anyway, whatever the acronym is, but it's, it's beyond just positive thinking because it is, it is about replacing in one's mind what you specifically want. And, and, and typically that would be a, a positive view of an outcome 
but it's just not happy thoughts. It's just not, it's just not all, um, you know, all about abundance because we understand at times there's going to be mid-course corrections. I mean, what did COVID-19 just do to us? It set us back. So positivity is not going to have COVID-19 go away, but creating a replacement picture each day on how we're going to think about how we're going to get through that day is the springboard, if you will, to getting beyond the negative. I'm going to go deeper into how to do that in just a bit, but it is, it is about positivity, but it's much, much more. Hopefully that helped. Uh, Ed Holmes just uh, jumped in and asked a question in the chat box. He says, how is this concept different than the power of positive thinking? That's what I had just shared. And uh, I know you were focused on that, but that's what I just shared. There's an element of positive thinking in mental technology, if you will, but it's much beyond that. So what I'll do, I'm going to swiftly now go to the how, if you will, on how to reframe uh, the negative mindset, if you will, to, um, to the affirmation of succeeding, if you will, setting a goal and achieving, okay? So moving on. Another little exercise, defining a leader. I'd like you all for a minute to think about the, uh, a leader that you would really wanna emulate, someone that you would wanna be like, someone that you have uh, really espoused over, over your life or career. That person could be dead or alive. That person, person could be known to you or someone not known to you. That person could be um, on your team or in your family. But just think of the attributes of that individual that, um, that you really would want to embrace and, 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 and have for yourself in your mind's eye now. It'd be great if you could throw it in the chat box. Any characteristics of that leader that you would want to emulate, that person that you would want to be like, the characteristics of that individual? John, Nikki? Selfless. Any Beautiful, selfless. That that servant leadership that you mentioned yesterday, Nikki. I just typed it in the chat, but um, confident, compassionate, fair, and honest. Love it. Great. Enthusiastic, Jim. Thank you. Agreed. Empathy, patience, understanding, compassion, honest. Beautiful. Thank you so very much. Now, real quickly, let's flip that on its ear. Think about an individual that you wouldn't want to emulate, someone you wouldn't want to be like, someone that, that really you, you repel. You just don't want, uh, you, you just would never want to be like that or, or influence others to be like that. Think of those characteristics, please, and shoot them back at me. Dictator, beautiful. Thank you, Jim. Selfish. Selfish, the opposite of selfless. Good, grumpy, another one, good. Nikki? Thanks for um, working with me. Self-centered. Selfish, and, and selfish and dishonest. Beautiful, dishonest, ego-driven, threatening, right on. So continuing, you all, as I asked John and uh, Nikki a bit ago, do you believe that mindset matters? The answer was yes. Well, based on what you all shared then is that you believe mindset matters as well. Because when you look at this wedge, that includes habits, attitudes, beliefs, and expectations, which can equate to mindset. It is mindset. Well, that's what's standing in the way of your potential and your outcomes. And we all know that we've got so much potential to tap into. Typically, we only really use a small percentage of it. And so I want to express to you, for those of you who believe that mindset is about being smart, it's not, because none of you said oh my gosh, the leader I want to be like is very, very smart. They've got many degrees. They use big words. You know, they're very intelligent. And also on the flip side, none of you said, well, that individual who I repel, don't want to be like, is a dummy. And they have no degrees and they're not smart. They don't have the technical aptitude or the technical skills. So as we talk about mindset mattering, I give, I'm giving you all kinds of ways to prove that whether it's 100 years ago with Napoleon Hill or current science or my own little journey about awareness mindset, what am I missing? Or the very exercise that you all have gone through, getting different numbers of Fs in that sentence, mindset does matter. And so now we're gonna move on to the elements of, of, or the tactical ways that you can recast your own mindset 
to move this wedge, habits, attitudes, and beliefs and expectations back to the left, if you will, on your screen. So you tap into greater potential to drive greater achievement. What I'd like to do next, and I know that we've got um, somewhat of a limited time, but I've got about a three and a half minute video that I'd like to share with you. And it's about the, the one element of mindset that you can consider is war, the most important. One of the most important, but I'm gonna say the most important. Before I go there though, out of habits, attitudes, beliefs, and expectations, which one do you, do you believe either drives you to stronger performance or really holds you back? Habits, attitudes, beliefs, or expectations. Let's vote. Nikki, what do you think? Attitude is, is most important. Good, good insight. Good insight. John? Habits. <clears throat> okay. Cool. Habits. Others, I'm looking at the chat. Habits, Jim, next. Anyone else? I Attitude think is everything. Expectations, you know, expectations seem to seem to make for more disappointing outcomes than than positive. Uh, let, let me uh, first of all, thank you for everyone weighing in. Uh, these are all equally important, but one rises to the top. And I'm going to suggest to you that it's habits, but habits are driven by beliefs. Now, going back to John and your point. Um, by, by mind is race. You go back to uh, the the outcropping of all of these other elements. All begin with thinking. Thinking drives beliefs. Drives all of these other elements. But when you habitualize activity, you're going to repeat that activity. Same thing with a bad golf swing. But going back to what John said about expectations, I'm going to submit that. If you, if you don't have an expectancy of a good outcome, don't even try because it ain't going to happen. And that is the law of, well, it's, it's, it's Dr. Albert Bandura out of Stanford University and the understanding of efficacy, effic efficaciousness, if you will, like the efficacy of a drug. How, how well will Moderna or, 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 or Pfizer keep us away from COVID-19? Well, the efficacy of your beliefs is going to set you on the course to either fail or not. And so going back to your mention, John, if you don't believe something's going to occur, don't even try it. Don't even set the goal. If you believe that you can't play golf, don't even, don't even go to the driving range and rent clubs. Okay, make sense? So yes, it will set you up for failure if you, believe, if you don't have the, res the resultant power in your mind that you, can, that you can cause something positive to happen. Good? Makes sense? Indeed. Okay, cool. So now moving on, what I want to do is show you this video on habits because it is so common for all of us to say, if we could only change this habit, if we could only get up in the morning and not trip over our sneakers and actually go for a walk, if we can only you know, go to the driving range on a regular basis, not only after, the, after, after my best round. Um, so I want to show you this video. It'll give you some more background information from our curriculum, Thought Patterns for High Performance. Uh, and, and I believe it's a worthwhile watch to give you a little bit more as it relates to the tactical implementation of how habits are formed and how you can change them. Good? Here we go. I'm going to stop share because I want to now share audio. We don't have the, uh, the video. I'm gonna give you that right now, share sound, and we're gonna go to sharing video now. See now? Perfect. When we talked about the three levels of the mind and our thought process, we noted that the subconscious is where we store everything we know about ourselves, gathered from past experiences. We mentioned that the subconscious also handles everything that is automatic, such as heartbeat, breathing, and so on. But what is important for us to know right now is that it also handles our habits and attitudes, 
both of which rely heavily on past experiences and can limit or enhance our ability to move forward. In order to create a habit, we start out on the conscious level. For example, let's take learning how to drive a car. We are very aware of what we are doing, where our hands are on the steering wheel, whether the seat is up far enough so we can reach the pedals, how the seat belt feels, what we can see in the rear view and side view mirrors. And that's before we even start the car. Once the car is moving, we become very aware of how fast we are going, keeping the car in the lane, and how sensitive those brakes can be. Because this is a totally new experience, we are white knuckling our grip on the steering wheel, moving our head from side to side, actively checking the mirrors, and slamming on the brakes in order to stop the car. But with practice, repeating the actions over and over, things smooth out, our confidence builds, and we can zip down the highway, one hand on the steering wheel, singing along with our tunes, relaxed and having a great time. In short, we've turned a conscious act over to our subconscious and created a habit. Our brains love habits. They are great labor-saving devices. Once those neural pathways are set, the brain can use its energy in other ways and in other places. There is a great advantage to being able to rely on our habits. We don't need to stop and think about how to do many routine things, like driving a car. In fact, we can get incredibly efficient using our habits. Remember that 80% of our brain's activity that we aren't aware of? Habits form a good part of that 80%. We get in a state of flow, where we have our work, our days, down pat. The downside to this is we only get the results we've always gotten because of this mindless efficiency. Our habits are now traps and we can easily get stuck if they aren't effective for us. Because we aren't consciously paying attention to what we're doing, we subconsciously reject anything that gets in the way of this habitual flow. Our minds are closed to new possibilities. The challenge comes when we need to do more and be more. We want to be able to open our minds to new ways to work, to think, to move to a new level of mindful efficiency. We want to create new habits, new patterns that allow us to grow. So how do we do that? Well, we have got the formula for you and it, they are, the formula is the four A's to designing success, awareness, acceptance, action, and achievement. And we've already spoken about awareness to a point and that that is, uh, is well illustrated with that scotoma exercise. So I'm gonna ask you all, where might you be missing something? I posed that question to you earlier, but the, the places to look are where you're working very, very hard to achieve something and you're not having good success. Where you've set a goal time and time again and you just get fatigued and you're not able to win the prize where you've tried to secure staff that has your same spirit of intent when it comes to customer service at your clubs, but because of COVID and not being able to, to secure those that, that might not be willing to come back to work at this point, or just folks that might love the game, but again, not love the service that goes by the game or, or go, that, that goes to support the game, where are you working hard and you're attempting to impact your environment and you're just missing it? Well, that's where you might have a scotoma. That's where you might need an awareness awakening moment. How do you do that? How do you get that? Especially when you, I'm assuming you're saying, Mark, if I don't see it, if it's a scotoma, if it's blind to me, where, how, how do I illuminate it? Well, you, you, you go to a trusted friend and say, I've been trying this for a long, long time. Uh, put your eyes on this. Give me your thoughts. Have you ever experienced this? Give me your insights. Um, trusted advisors should keep your thoughts very confidential and you can, feel, you can feel safe in that regard. Or you go to someone who you report to or even a trusted uh, family member saying, man, it's just not working out for me. Help me along and be willing to be vulnerable because that's the only way to grow. It's, it's, it's really adopting the phrase, how do we grow through what we're going through? But you have to have the awareness that you're missing something 
that you really want. So the next step after awareness to rehabilitate or to habitualize behavior that you want to continue in order to achieve a goal is accepting what you do want. But you need to know what you do want before you go after it. And a great example of that is, well, a little exercise here. If you are all leaders and uh, you're leading your club in this fashion, and uh, um, it's a little test, and you want to see if everybody's on the same page. So you ask the group, your team, all right, I'm thinking of a, of a breed of a dog. And you go around to your team and you say, okay, what breed of a dog, breed of a dog, John, are you thinking of right now? Breed of a dog. German Shepherd, you're on mute. Breed of a dog, Nikki. Beagle. Beagle, cool. Breed of a dog, anyone online? We're going to get a, uh, no, we got a German Shepherd, we got a Beagle. I want to move forward. So now I'm a leader. I didn't realize you're proficient at lip reading. Okay, it's all good, <laughs> right? We've, been, we've become addicted to Zoom. So I have become, we're, I'm going to get a coffee cup that says you're on mute. But anyway, so now I'm the leader and I want my team to envision what I'm envisioning. And I'm going to suggest that the breed of the dog of a dog that I'm thinking of, it's uh, the breed of the dog, is, is it, it's a white dog. It's, it's, uh, it's a happy white dog. It's wagging its tail. I'm seeing that happy white, white dog wagging its tail. Um, and that 60 pound male white dog wa wagging its tail, he's got black spots and he's sitting on a fire engine next to a fireman. What dog am I envisioning? John? Dalmatian. Nikki? Dalmatian. Got it. Everybody sees Dalmatian. Everybody sees seven Fs. So are you thinking of the weeds in the garden, the rock in the road, uh, the, the problems at the club and not being able to secure the right talent? Or are you envisioning, wait a second, service excellence, seamless, frictionless service, ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen, what the North Star, higher purpose. And are you painting that picture as leaders, as that true Michelangelo, as that true Picasso, seeing the work of art in your clubs in your mind's eye in order to conceive and believe and then achieve Napoleon Hill onto your club management. So it's awareness first of what I'm missing, acceptance of what I want, clear picture. And the next is action. And as you start moving people towards the picture of the Dalmatian, if you will, at your clubs, you're going to be pushing people or stretching people out of your comfort zone. And I think you can see in front of me, that I'm stretching one of our Pacific Institute rubber bands that's called the Pattern Interrupt Rubber Band because this is a great uh, visioning tool that we wanna get here. This is our goal, but we here are in current reality. What happens in between? Stress, pressure in the cognitive sciences as I've been trying to give you elements to prove these very concepts that's called cognitive dissonance. It's gonna throw you out of order. It's gonna throw your teams out of order. It's meant to be there. You just have to have such a, a strong lock on that vision, if you will, that it will help you move past the negative po positive attitude. We talked about positive attitude or, or um, uh, the PPA before, the, uh, the power of positive thinking, please forgive me, PPT. Well. Having be locked on that vision, understanding that we're going to go through some distress as we throw our teams out of order, going from, you know, this out of order state, excuse me, into going from in order in our present. Um, John, you mentioned it before. We're, you didn't say lazy, but we're complacent, I think you said before, right? Yeah, going from that complacency to a stretch, making sure that we are inviting folks back into our club, embracing them in this new world order in an extraordinary way that they keep coming back, that they choose you as the option versus going to Starbucks or some other entertainment venue for their, for their experience, investing elsewhere. And no, the, as Lao Tzu says, what a Chinese philosopher, you know, the, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. So you got to take that first step. But you, but you got to be aware that you're going to be stretching yourself, stretching your teams, and that you stress, that euphoric stress is meant to be there, okay? So awareness, acceptance, action, and the next is achievement. At the end of the day, you got to celebrate. You got to celebrate the successes. You got to celebrate with your team. You got to be grateful. 
Gratitude is the unyielding fuel for courage. You got to share a smile. You got to pick others up. You got to pick yourself up. Again, not just about positive thinking. It's about having an eye on the prize, being clear about it, making sure everybody sees the seven Fs, making sure everybody sees the Dalmatians, understanding that there will be some mid-course corrections along the way. But that's what happens when you rehabitualize behavior, right? You get up in the morning and you go and exercise and you might be a little bit sore the next day, but you can't press news. You got to get out of bed, put the sneaks on again and either get on that treadmill or go to the driving range and uh, hit a bucket of balls. So awareness, acceptance, action, achievement, those are the little literal elements to, re, to, to recreate habits, if you will, in order to not only set a goal, but more importantly, to achieve one. And in conclusion, here we go. Speaking of the subconscious, how is transference or countertransference from guests, employees, and coworkers related to the use of evolution of personal? Well, interesting. We teach about the reticular activating system, and I can't go too deep into this from Brian, but this is real, and it's the transference of your own attitude on others. And so if you are not in flow, if you are not, if you don't have that servant leadership heart, I'm trading on that because that's what John mentioned to me yesterday. If you're only there for the money, if you're only there because you want what one of your teammates may just want a, a free round of golf on you know Saturday afternoons, no, 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 because that attitude is going to transfer. That is going to exude from that individual, and and it's real because again, next time if, when you have me back, we'll teach you all about the reticular activating system, which actually clues folks in subconsciously to either succeeding, achieving a goal or not. So what Brian just mentioned absolutely is real, okay? Um, I want to be respectful of time. Uh, let me just share one last piece. And then any Q&A, here we go. A little visual for you. Let's go here last. Here we go. How do you all feel? Can we all feel like that? I'm waiting for the smile. There we go. So John and Nikki sees it. Scotoma busters for one another. If you take nothing else away, take that one. Scotoma busters for yourselves and for others as well, because that's what, what's going to drive the four A's of designing success, awareness, acceptance, action, and achievement. What I'd like you to do is take a screenshot of this, please. Let me help you. We actually can measure mindset. We can measure your habits, attitudes, beliefs, and expectations, those that are holding you back, your lim limiting beliefs. And we can also measure those that are serving you, your liberating beliefs. And we will provide you a summary report of that assessment. Very, very easy, all done online, gratis. And I'd love to spend 30 minutes with you to go through your results. So make sure that you take a little screenshot here, the pacificinstitute.co forward slash or yeah forward slash mark one and i look forward to being with you again want to follow up with all of you um this is absolutely tied to the the sport of golf but it's absolutely also tied to the customer experience of of the of the whole event that surrounds all that you do and basically you're in the business of happiness um, you're in the business of entertainment. You're in the business of making people's lives better. Let me help you do that. John, after you. Open for questions, please. Now, forgive me if you, uh, did you address the Brian Bishop question down there? I did. That's the transference or counter transference from guests. So it is those that we employ can absolutely transfer mindset. And I, but I, I want to be careful because this isn't mysticism. I, I was actually at University of Pennsylvania. They can prove what Brian just said. So it's from the individual, from the, from the teammate to the guest, but also from the guest back to the teammate. But we've got to be resilient, gritty, persistent to help our teammates when the guest, we do a lot of work with the Club Managers Association of America. So we get the struggle when you're dealing with guests that might not espouse or aspire to the four A's of designing success. So yes, to Brian's question, it is real. Any others, please? Yeah, the dynamic of uh, when you're talking about the, the four A's and in the acceptance where you said you have to be vulnerable in order to reach out for that help, for, to reach out for that support, to, to have that desire to learn. 
How does that vulnerability walk a fine line in terms of maintaining your consistency and demeanor as a leader in terms of looking vulnerable? Certainly. Well, number one, as I mentioned, um, when you're looking for help, guidance, support, direction, you want to go to a trusted teammate, a trusted participant, a, a trusted family member, because you you will be vulnerable, but that shouldn't affect consistency. And I'll just use me as an example. We live by our core values at the Pacific Institute. I mean, it is our covenant. It is our Bible. And we also live tactically by objectives and key results. My covenant to our team is if you don't see Mark Pansiero living by all that we espouse, our covenant, our Bible, we, I want you to coach me. I want to be made aware. I didn't say call me out, dress me down in public, but make me aware. So I, I, I embrace vulnerability because I want to learn and grow. But that is a consistent message throughout the team. And I'm a caregiver at heart. I'm all about servant leadership. So it is natural for me to be, to, to be vulnerable with strength, in strength. But it's an efficacy. It's a belief in what I am transferring. And that's Brian's piece that he asked earlier, that I'm transferring strength, but not dogmatic strength, strength, strength of leadership. Because I want to impact others better. And if somebody can share with me where I'm missing an F, I want to hear it, but I also want to be held in high regard because I hold others in high regard. So we're going to treat one another with grace and respect, but that is the culture that must be present in order for it not to unravel and uh, have it be used as a sword. Make sense, John? What about uh, teammates in just human nature in general, our natural resistance to change? Right. Great. These are all great questions. And I gave you so very much in the last 55 minutes, but that's what I mentioned about that you stress. It's going to naturally happen when you throw ones, when you throw yourself out of order, when you're changing your behavior activity, how many of you have changed your golf swing for the better, assuming that you all have picked up a club, maybe at some point, it feels awkward. That is your mind, your flow, which wasn't really serving you before out of order. So that resistance is going to happen. However, we want to make sure that it is, it is we call it eustress, euphoric stress, that it's created, it's, it's, it's understanding that it's meant to be there because we're going out of our comfort zone. We are in a discomfort zone. And so you call it out. It's the awareness that that is happening. Everybody understands that. We talk all about being uh, heat-seeking missile, missiles. Where are we going? Dalmatian seven Fs, understanding at times you got to make mid-course corrections and you got to help your team along the way because people will be resistant. It is natural. And if you don't stretch one another, what's going to happen? They're going to shrink back down to their comfort zone. They're going to move back into that area where there is no growth and there is no new possibility. Hopefully that helped, John. Indeed. Tremendous Indeed. catalyst. Many thanks to Mark for his enthusiasm. Thank you. And P.S. again, I'm here, 95. Here's my cell, 954-684-1650. Email address mpansiera at the Pacific Institute.com. John's got all my contact. Sign up for this uh, uh, mindset, this mindset assessment. We'll spend some time together. I just wanted to give you tools for change, all based in the sciences, share my own journey with you, knowing that you are making communities better. People, you're part of the therapy of our country now. So embrace that and thank you for your efforts. Back to you, John. Thank you very much, Mark. Tremendous, tremendous. You see the comments coming in on the chat board down there from Ed Holmes, tremendous catalyst. Many thanks to Mark for his enthusiasm and wonderful knowledge. And uh, a lot of thanks coming in. And, you know, Mark, thank you again on, uh, on behalf of the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. Uh, thank you very much for, for volunteering your time to do this. Mr. Adderidge, you're on the, uh, on the webcast this morning. Thank you very much for connecting us with, uh, with Mark. Um, truly tremendous. Thank you very much for your time today. Want to encourage everybody, 
The Catalyst Webinar Series is every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific. Please join us next Thursday with SCPGA President Robin Shelton. It'll be his presidential Catalyst. Robin has presented on the Catalyst uh, many times over on different subject matters of, of service and, and uh, this is his president, presidential Catalyst. So we encourage you all to be on the webcast next week. Again, John, Mark. one more piece. That, thank you. One more piece, John. Thank you to John and Nikki for, for interacting with me. It just made it a bit easier to incite some thinking on the other end. So thank you for that. Also, this presentation can be two days long. There is so very much in it. So we want to help be a catalyst for change in your organizations, your clubs. So please invite us to your clubs. Uh, because what we want to do is help you all to tap into not only your own potential, but those of your organization to drive greater performance. Appreciate you all. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Thank Mark. You. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Everybody have a great day. We'll see you next week. Stay safe. Stay sane. Bye-bye. Thank you.